Much labor was required at this meeting. New churches had been raised up since our last camp meeting. Precious souls had accepted the truth, and these needed to be carried forward to a deeper and more thorough knowledge of practical godliness. The Lord gave me freedom in bearing my testimony. Upon one occasion during this meeting, I made some remarks upon the necessity of economy in dress and in the expenditure of means. There is danger of becoming careless and reckless in the use of the Lord's money. Young men who engage in tent labor should be careful not to indulge in unnecessary expense. As tents are entering new fields, and as the missionary work is enlarging, the wants of the cause are many, and without stinginess the most rigid economy should be used in this matter. It is easier to run up a bill than to settle it. There are many things that would be convenient and enjoyable that are not needful, and that can be dispensed with without actual suffering. It is very easy to multiply hotel bills and railroad fares, expenses that might be avoided or very much lessened. We have passed over the road to and from California twelve times and have not expended one dollar for meals at the restaurants or in the attached dining car. We eat our meals from our lunch baskets. After being three days out, the food becomes quite stale, but a little milk or warm gruel supplies our lack. On another occasion, I spoke in reference to genuine sanctification, which is nothing less than a daily dying to self and daily conformity to the will of God. While in Oregon, I was shown that some of the young churches of the New England Conference were in danger through the blighting influence of what is called sanctification. Some would become deceived by this doctrine, while others, knowing its deceptive influence, would realize their danger and turn from it. Paul's sanctification was a constant conflict with self. Said he, I die daily. His will and his desires every day conflicted with duty and the will of God. Instead of following inclination, he did the will of God, however unpleasant and crucifying to his nature. We called on those who desired to be baptized and those who were keeping the Sabbath for the first time to come forward. Twenty-five responded. These bore excellent testimonies, and before the close of the camp meeting, twenty-two received baptism. We were pleased to meet here our old friends of the cause who acquaintance we made thirty years ago. Our much-esteemed brother Hastings is as deeply interested in the truth today as he was then. We were pleased to meet Sister Temple and Sister Collins of Dartmouth, Massachusetts, and Brother and Sister Wilkinson, at whose house we were entertained more than thirty years ago. The pilgrimage of some of these dear ones may close ere long, but if faithful unto the end, they will receive a crown of life. We were interested in Brother Kimball, who is a mute and has been a missionary among the mutes. Through his persevering labors, quite a little company have accepted the truth. We meet this faithful brother at our yearly camp meetings, surrounded by several of his mute converts. Someone who can hear writes out as much as possible of the discourse, and he sits surrounded by his mute friends, reading and actively preaching it over again to them with his hands. He has freely used his means to advance the missionary work, thus honoring God with his substance. We left Ballard Vale Tuesday morning, September 3, to attend the main camp meeting. We enjoyed a quiet rest at the home of young brother Morton near Portland. He and his good wife made our tarry with them very pleasant. We were upon the main campground before the Sabbath and we're happy to meet here some of the tried friends of the cause. There are some who are ever at their post of duty, come sunshine or come storm. There is also a class of sunshine Christians, 
When everything goes well and it is agreeable to their feelings, they are fervent and zealous. But when there are clouds and disagreeable things to meet, these will have nothing to say or do. The blessing of God rested upon the active workers, while those who did nothing were not benefited by the meeting as they might have been. The Lord was with his ministers, who labor faithfully in presenting both doctrinal and practical subjects. We greatly desired to see many benefited by that meeting who gave no evidence that they had been blessed of God. I long to see this dear people coming up to their exalted privileges. We left the campground on Monday, feeling much exhausted. We designed to attend the Iowa and Kansas camp meetings. My husband had written that he would meet me in Iowa. Being unable to attend the Vermont meeting, we went directly from Maine to South Lancaster. I had much difficulty in breathing, and my heart pained me continually. I rested at the quiet home of Sister Harris, who did all in her power to help me. Thursday evening, we ventured to resume our journey to Battle Creek. I dared not trust myself on the cars any length of time in my state of health, so we stopped at Rome, New York, and spoke to our people on the Sabbath. There was a good attendance. Monday morning, I visited brother and sister Ira Abbey at Brookfield. We had a profitable interview with this family. We felt interested and anxious that they should finally be victorious in the Christian warfare and win eternal life. We felt deeply anxious that Brother Abbey should overcome his discouragements, cast himself unreservedly upon the merits of Christ, make a success of overcoming, and at last wear the victor's crown. Tuesday we took the cars for Battle Creek, and the next day arrived at home, where I was glad to rest once more and take treatment at the sanitarium. I felt that I was indeed favored in having the advantages of this institution. The helpers were kind and attentive and ready at any time of day or night to do their utmost to relieve me of my infirmities. Chapter 11 At Battle Creek The national camp meeting was held at Battle Creek October 2 through 14. This was the largest gathering of Seventh-day Adventists ever held. More than 40 ministers were present. We were all happy to hear meet Elders Andrews and Bordeaux from Europe and Elder Lowborough from California. At this meeting was represented the cause in Europe, California, Texas, Alabama, Virginia, Dakota, Colorado, and in all of the northern states from Maine to Nebraska. Here I was happy to join my husband in labor, and although much worn and suffering with heart difficulty, the Lord gave me strength to speak to the people nearly every day, and sometimes twice a day. My husband labored very hard. He was present at nearly all the business meetings, and preached almost every day in his usual plain, pointed style. I did not think I should have strength to speak more than twice or three times during the meeting, but as the meeting progressed, my strength increased. Upon several occasions, I stood on my feet four hours, inviting the people forward for prayers. I never felt the special help of God more sensibly than during this meeting. Notwithstanding these labors, I steadily increased in strength, and to the praise of God I here record the fact that I was far better in health at the close of that meeting than I had been for six months. On Wednesday of the second week of the meeting, a few of us united in prayer for a sister who was afflicted with despondency. While praying, I was greatly blessed. The Lord seemed very near. I was taken off in a vision of God's glory and shown many things. I then went to meeting, and with a solemn sense of the condition of our people, I made brief statements of the things which had been shown me. I have since written out some of these in testimonies to individuals, appeals to ministers, and in various other articles given in this book. These were meetings of solemn power and of the deepest interest. Several connected with our Office of Publication were convicted and converted to the truth 
and bore clear, intelligent testimonies. Infidels were convicted and took their stand under the banner of Prince Emmanuel. This meeting was a decided victory. One hundred and twelve were baptized before its close. The week following the camp meeting, my labors in speaking, praying, and writing testimonies were more taxing than during the meeting. Two or three meetings were held each day in behalf of our ministers. These were of intense interest and of great importance. Those who bear this message to the world should have a daily experience in the things of God and be in every sense converted men, sanctified through the truth which they present to others, representing in their lives Jesus Christ. Then, and not till then, will they be successful in their work. Most earnest efforts were made to draw nigh to God by confession, humiliation, and prayer. Many said that they saw and felt the importance of their work as ministers of Christ as they had never seen and felt it before. Some felt deeply the magnitude of the work and their responsibility before God, but we longed to see a greater manifestation of the Spirit of God. I knew that when the way was cleared, the Spirit of God would come in as on the day of Pentecost. But there were so many at such a distance from God that they did not seem to know how to exercise faith. The appeals to ministers found elsewhere in this number more fully express what God has shown me relative to their sad condition and their high privileges. Chapter 12 Kansas Camp Meetings Accompanied by my daughter Emma, we left Battle Creek October 23 for the Kansas Camp Meeting. At Topeka, Kansas, we left the cars and rode by private conveyance 12 miles to Richland, the place of meeting. We found the settlement of tents in a grove. It being late in the season for camp meetings, every preparation was made for cold weather that could be made. There were 17 tents on the ground besides the large tent, which accommodated several families, and every tent had a stove. Sabbath morning it commenced snowing, but not one meeting was suspended. About an inch of snow fell, and the air was piercing cold. Women with little children clustered about the stoves. It was touching to see 150 people assembled for a convocation meeting under these circumstances. Some came 200 miles by private conveyance. All seemed hungry for the bread of life and thirsty for the water of salvation. Elder Haskell spoke Friday afternoon and evening. Sabbath morning I felt called upon to speak encouraging words to those who had made so great an effort to attend the meeting. Sunday afternoon there was quite a large outside attendance, considering that the meeting was located so far from the thoroughfares of travel. Monday morning I spoke to the brethren from the third chapter of Malachi. We then called for those to come forward who wanted to be Christians and who had not the evidence of their acceptance with God. About thirty responded. Some were seeking the Lord for the first time, and some who were members of other churches were taking their position upon the Sabbath. We gave all an opportunity to speak, and the free spirit of the Lord was in our meeting. After prayer had been offered for those who had come forward, candidates for baptism were examined. Six were baptized. I was glad to hear Elder Haskell present before the people the necessity of placing reading matter in private families, especially the three volumes of Spirit of Prophecy and the four volumes of Testimonies. These could be read aloud during the long winter evenings by some member of the family, so that all the family might be instructed. I then spoke of the necessity of parents properly educating and disciplining their children. The greatest evidence of the power of Christianity that can be presented to the world is a well-ordered, well-disciplined family. This will recommend the truth as nothing else can, for it is a living witness of its practical power upon the heart. Tuesday morning the meeting closed, and with my daughter Emma, Elder Haskell, and Brother Stover, 
we went to Topeka and took the cars for Sherman, Kansas, where another camp meeting had been appointed. This meeting was interesting and profitable. It appeared small when compared with our camp meetings in other states, as there were only about 100 brethren and sisters present. It was designed for a general gathering of the scattered ones. Some were present from southern Kansas, Arkansas, Kentucky, Missouri, Nebraska, and Tennessee. At this meeting, my husband joined me, and from here, with Elder Haskell and our daughter, we went to Dallas, Texas. Chapter 13. Visit to Texas. Thursday, we went to Brother McDearman's at Grand Prairie. Here, our daughter met her parents, brother and sister, who had all been brought near to the door of death by the fever which prevailed in the state during the past season. We took great pleasure in ministering to the wants of this afflicted family, who had in years past liberally assisted us in our affliction. We left them, somewhat improved in health, to attend the Plano camp meeting. This meeting was held November 12 through 19. The weather was fine at the commencement, but it soon began to rain, and this, with high winds, prevented a general attendance from the surrounding country. Here we were happy to meet our old friends, Elder R. M. Kilgore and wife, and we were highly pleased to find a large and intelligent body of brethren on the ground. Whatever prejudices have existed here against people from the north, nothing of the kind appeared among these dear brethren and sisters. My testimony was never received more readily and heartily than by this people. I became deeply interested in the work in the great state of Texas. It has ever been Satan's object to preoccupy every important field. And probably he has never been more busily employed at the introduction of the truth in any state than he has been in Texas. This is the best evidence to my mind that there is a great work to be done here. Chapter 14 Preparation for Christ's Coming In the late vision given me at Battle Creek during our general camp meeting, I was shown our danger as a people of becoming assimilated to the world rather than to the image of Christ. We are now upon the very borders of the eternal world, but it is the purpose of the adversary of souls to lead us to put far off the close of time. Satan will in every conceivable manner assail those who profess to be the commandment-keeping people of God and to be waiting for the second appearing of our Savior in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He will lead as many as possible to put off this evil day and become in spirit like the world, imitating its customs. I felt alarmed as I saw that the spirit of the world was controlling the hearts and minds of many who make a high profession of the truth. Selfishness and self-indulgence are cherished by them, but true godliness and sterling integrity are not cultivated. The angel of God pointed to those who profess the truth and in a solemn voice repeated these words, and take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, and so that day shall come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore, and pray always, that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man. In consideration of the shortness of time, we as a people should watch and pray, and in no case allow ourselves to be diverted from the solemn work of preparation for the great event before us. Because the time is apparently extended, many have become careless and indifferent in regard to their words and actions. They do not realize their danger and do not see and understand the mercy of our God in lengthening their probation, that they may have time to form characters for the future immortal life. Every moment is of the highest value. 
time is granted them not to be employed in studying their own ease and becoming dwellers on the earth, but to be used in the work of overcoming every defect in their own characters and in helping others by example and personal effort to see the beauty of holiness. God has a people upon the earth who in faith and holy hope are tracing down the role of fast fulfilling prophecy and are seeking to purify their souls by obeying the truth that they may not be found without the wedding garment when Christ shall appear. Many who have called themselves Adventists have been time setters. Time after time has been set for Christ to come, but repeated failures have been the result. The definite time of our Lord's coming is declared to be beyond the ken of mortals. Even the angels who minister unto those who shall be heirs of salvation know not the day nor the hour. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Because the times repeatedly set have passed, the world is in a more decided state of unbelief than before in regard to the near advent of Christ, they look upon the failures of the time-setters with disgust, and because men have been so deceived, they turn from the truth substantiated by the word of God that the end of all things is at hand. Those who so presumptuously preach definite time, in so doing gratify the adversary of souls, for they are advancing infidelity rather than Christianity. They produce scripture, and by false interpretation show a chain of argument which apparently proves their position, but their failures show that they are false prophets, that they do not rightly interpret the language of inspiration. The word of God is truth and verity, but men have perverted its meaning. These errors have brought the truth of God for these last days into disrepute. Adventists are derided by ministers of all denominations, yet God's servants must not hold their peace. The signs foretold in prophecy are fast fulfilling around us. This should arouse every true follower of Christ to zealous action. Those who think they must preach definite time in order to make an impression upon the people do not work from the right standpoint. The feelings of the people may be stirred and their fears aroused, but they do not move from principle. And excitement is created, but when the time passes, as it has done repeatedly, those who moved out upon time fall back into coldness, darkness, and sin, and it is almost impossible to arouse their consciences without some great excitement. In Noah's day, the inhabitants of the old world laughed to scorn what they termed the superstitious fears and forebodings of the preacher of righteousness. He was denounced as a visionary character, a fanatic, an alarmist. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. Men will reject the solemn message of warning in our day, as they did in Noah's time, they will refer to those false teachers who have predicted the event and set the definite time and will say that they have no more faith in our warning than in theirs. This is the attitude of the world today. Unbelief is widespread and the preaching of Christ's coming is mocked at and derided. This makes it all the more essential that those who believe present truth should show their faith by their works. They should be sanctified through the truth which they profess to believe, for they are a savor of life unto life or of death unto death. Noah preached to the people of his time that God would give them 120 years in which to repent of their sins and find refuge in the ark, but they refused the gracious invitation. Abundant time was given them to turn from their sins, overcome their bad habits, and develop righteous characters. But inclination to sin, 
though weak at first with many, strengthened through repeated indulgence and hurried them on to irretrievable ruin. The merciful warning of God was rejected with sneers, with mockery and derision, and they were left in darkness to follow the course that their sinful hearts had chosen. But their unbelief did not hinder the predicted event. It came, and great was the wrath of God which was seen in the general ruin.